Welcome to the Red Clinic Podcast. My name is Dr. Schwalen. I'm a licensed psychologist and expert in the treatment of eating disorders. We are going to continue with the series that I started a few weeks ago on going more in depth into each eating disorder diagnosis. So, so far we've covered anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and atypical anorexia. Today, we're going to go more in depth into what binge eating disorder is. And so I think that a lot, there are a lot of misconceptions and myths or biases um, about binge eating disorder. And so I'm actually really looking forward to talking about this today because I think with just more information out there and a deeper understanding of really how to approach binge eating disorder, um, a lot more people are going to be able to get the help that they need. So what I've been doing is I've been talking about kind of, you know, how many people are usually affected by the disorder, um, what it looks like out there in the real world, and then also giving the background on how it's defined per the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. That's that fancy book that... Um, psychiatrists and psychologists and doctors will use to just try to figure out how many criteria are being met and what could be going on with somebody. So I'm going to start there, actually. So per the DSM, binge eating disorder has um, four to five criteria that need to be really ex like examined or considered when working with a client who may meet criteria for this. Basically, it's characterized by recurrent episodes of binge eating. Now, I've spoken about what that definition of binge eating is when I talked more in depth um, about bulimia. And so I'm just going to talk about it again because it's really good to understand like really what that means. So an episode of binge eating per the DSM is characterized by two things. The first thing is that someone has to eat in a discrete am amount of time. So we usually say about a two hour period of time, an amount of food that is definitely larger than what most people would eat in a similar period of time under similar circumstances. The second part of what makes a binge a true binge is a sense of lack of control over eating. So the person during that episode or during the binge episode really feels that they can't stop eating or control how much they're eating. So usually when someone is engaging in binge eating, they are eating past the point of fullness. They may be eating to the point of feeling really uncomfortable. And sometimes they're eating to the point of even getting sick. And so that's what that means. They just feel like they can't stop eating. They can't really control it. And when I talk to clients about this, because I do so many assessments for clients who have binge eating disorder or just engage in binge eating. Um, and so that's another thing I just did, right? I'm making it, I'm, I'm kind of setting it up to say that just because someone engages in binge eating doesn't mean they have binge eating disorder, because binge eating can show up for many different reasons and in different ways. So I'll talk about all that in a few minutes. But when they're talking about the binge, most people will say like, in my head, I know what I'm doing and I don't really like that I'm doing it. Or I know I'm going to regret it afterwards. I'm not proud that I'm doing it. But it's just something that I feel compelled to do or something that I really feel like I can't control. So that's really what we're looking for is that if feeling of in control and really how the person describes it. Another part to binge eating disorder is that the binge episodes are associated, according to the DSM, with three or more of the following. And then if you go look, it's like a whole list of things. So there's five things that are listed there. So three or more of these have to be present when someone has a binge eating episode. So it's eating much more rapidly than normal, eating until feeling uncomfortably full, eating large amounts of food when not feeling physically hungry, eating alone because of feeling embarrassed by how much one is eating, and feeling disgusted with oneself, depressed, or very guilty afterwards. So there is an absolute like emotional component to the binge eating disorder and the binge eating episodes. The third criteria for binge eating disorder, it's, it literally says 
marked marked distress regarding binge eating is present. So just to break that down, the person who is engaging in the binge eating is really not happy about it. They feel like they have a problem. They feel like they need help with that problem. Um, There's a lot of guilt and shame associated with it. And it's causing a lot of stress for them because they really feel out of control and want life to be different. The fourth part of this is that the binge eating occurs on average at least once a week for three months. So it's not just something that happens because, you know, a lot of people will wait uh, to eat anything on Thanksgiving because they know they're going to binge later, right? I kind of talked about that last time when I, I said like, hey, let's break down these words. I mean, we use the word binge so, so commonly um, in, in today's society that's kind of lost its meaning. Like I'm going to binge on Netflix tonight or even the word purge, you know, I kind of brought that up last time. I said, you know, when we spring clean, we'll, we'll say we're going to do a purge and we're not really understanding the true meaning behind those words anymore. So we want to really see that it's happening often enough where it's not just a once in a while thing um, or an occasional event. It's really something that is happening enough to impact somebody's life, right? So uh, nor- it's happening often enough during the week. Maybe it's affecting their sleep or their work schedule or their social relationships. We also want to see the effect that it's happening just on overall functioning as a human being. And then the last part of binge eating disorder is that the binge eating is not associated with any other kind of eating disorder. So it's not happening um, because the person has bulimia. Rather, it's happening by itself. It's not, you know, so we're really looking to make sure that we're considering, could this be anything else? Um, Do we need to rule in or rule out another type of reason why the person may be binge eating? You know, are there medical issues here that haven't been addressed? Is this secondary to some other kind of condition? Or is this like a true binge eating disorder that can stand on its own? So that's really what we're looking for. Now, the other thing I really like to do as a expert in the treatment of eating disorders is, is to remember that eating disorders are not just psychiatric, right? They're medical too. And the toll that eating disorders can take on someone's body is very real. So considering medical complications, even though I'm not a medical doctor, but I am still responsible for my client's health holistically, And so I'm always going to be um, aware of what those medical complications can be. And uh, in close collaboration with my team members, like my dietitian, or if the person has a physician or a psychiatrist, to make sure that person is being treated holistically. So there are medical complications that are associated with binge eating disorder. Medical complications come in the form of vomiting or even aspiration. I defined what that was in a couple episodes ago, but Aspiration essentially just means when someone inhales their own vomit into their lungs, and so that can be very dangerous for them. Metabolic syndrome, that can be associated more with um, like just complications of, of um, eating too many of the same foods over and over again, maybe being really severely overweight, just different complications that can happen. And so metabolic syndrome is things like high blood pressure or cholesterol, um, prediabetes, things like that, that doctors are going to look at when they are concerned about somebody maybe fitting this criteria. There's glucose dysregulation. So all that means is like blood sugars get messed up, right? So if people are restricting all day, they might you might feel that feeling of like, oh, I just feel kind of weak or I have low blood sugar, or, I'm kind of dizzy. And then eating way too much that, you know, more than you should have can really upset that balance. There's also increased risk of some of that metabolic syndrome types of things that I mentioned. So hypertension, which is high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, and even changes to like bone. So osteoarthritis is one of the complications that are associated with binge eating disorder. So that's just bone health issues. Um, because people, even though they may be eating, they may not be getting enough variety. They may not be choosing foods that have enough vitamins or minerals. 
Um, and if I had a dietitian here with me today, I'd be getting super in depth into all of that because that stuff is so important. But I say all of this just to point out that um, body type doesn't really have anything to do with eating disorders. And I think a lot of the times people think you can look at someone and just decide what's going on with them. So a lot of people will associate binge eating disorder with being overweight. And I can honestly say from all the work I've done and all the experiences I've had working with different people, is that people with binge eating disorder actually come in all different shapes and sizes. So it's not really a fact that people with binge eating disorder have to be overweight. And the same goes for any kind of eating disorder, actually. So like atypical anorexia I spoke about last time, when I mentioned that um, someone who presents with that disorder can actually be in their normal weight or overweight, right? And above their normal weight range. Someone with avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, for example, uh, that's a disorder that I might talk about next week. They can present either underweight, normal weight, or above their uh, average weight range. And so you get the whole spectrum of weight that can be associated with any of the eating disorders pretty much except for anorexia. I think anorexia is really the only eating disorder that specifies really that the person is um, underweight. All of the other eating disorders really truly can affect any, any shape, any size. And the same is true for binge eating disorder. Um, so now with that being said, I am gonna talk a little bit about the clients that I see who come in with true binge eating disorder and then some who are more subclinical and maybe the reasons why they come in because if they're subclinical, so what that means is they don't meet every single box and I can't check everything off, but there's enough going on where it's like, hmm, if this doesn't get treated, it could get worse and turn into a full blown eating disorder, or it's definitely causing enough distress for the client that I want to do something to help them. And so there's a lot of different reasons why people will come in. So some people with binge eating disorder, you know, I kind of alluded to this before when I was talking about bulimia, but they really do struggle with some of the same feelings of being trapped or um, just out of control. Like, like they don't want to do this, but they feel like they have no other choice. So they're so ingrained in that pattern of turning to food and engaging in the binge that they don't really know what else to do. And so they are spending a lot of money when they're um, purchasing food. So sometimes, you know, like the DSM says, it's all, all at one time in two hours, they eat a large amount of food. And I've said this before, but that's kind of like the old school way of looking at things. Because with the pandemic and the move towards virtual everything and just our technology these days, there's a whole bunch of different ways to get food now. So I've heard clients talk about... Um, ordering huge um, orders on like DoorDash or Uber Eats or some other kind of delivery service where they're spending hundreds of dollars on food and then they're eating that food in, in a specific period of time. Um, the other way that binges can look is maybe driving from drive through to drive through So, you know, instead of sitting at home and doing it, they're just in the car and doing it. And so they might go to McDonald's, for example, and order... Um, a large sized meal and then maybe a few minutes later drive down the street and go to the next uh, fast food restaurant and order a meal there. Um, it, it just really depends on the person. So I've heard all different versions of what a binge can look like. I've also heard that a binge doesn't necessarily have to happen in a short amount of time, um, that it can happen throughout the entire day. So someone feeling compelled to eat all of the food that they've taken out for themselves or prepared for themselves and not feel like they can leave any behind. So this is particularly true that I see in my experience for clients who have maybe had some bariatric surgery in the past. So these are like gastric sleeves, um, uh, the band, I'm not really, I don't remember all the procedure names, but there's several different procedures and they're kind of known as like the weight loss surgery. And so I'll talk about the, that in a minute, but clients who get these procedures done, 
can't necessarily eat large amounts of food anymore because it could do a lot of damage and it's it's just really contraindicated or goes against why they got that surgery in the first place. And so they end up eating small amounts of food all day long until the same amount that they would have taken in a binge has still been ingested. It's just been done over a longer period of time. Uh, So essentially the person just keeps going back to it and eating small amounts or grazing on it until it's all gone. I've even heard feeling so compelled to eat that, you know, there's like a refusal to leave leftovers. So imagining like packing the food up and putting it in the fridge for later is really, really difficult for someone who might have binge eating disorder. And they are not able to get up from the table until all of that food is gone or consumed. Now, the thing about binge eating disorder that makes it different than bulimia, for example, is that there is no compensatory behavior associated with the intake of calories. So there's no overexercising. There's no purging behaviors. So like self-induced vomiting is not happening. The use of laxatives is, is not happening. Uh, there's usually not like restriction to make up for the binge. There's just really no thought process of how do I make up for it now that I've taken all of this in? So that's really kind of what sets that apart. The compensatory behavior is not there. Um, emotional overeating and compulsive overeating, those are types of that subclinical or other specified feeding in eating disorder kind of thing that I was talking about last time. It's, it's not enough to reach the threshold for like full binge eating disorder, but there's definitely the emotional component, the feeling out of control, the feelings of guilt um, that are associated with it. There's overeating that happens to the point of being uncomfortable. Maybe there's overeating that happens and then the sense of shame or guilt that happens afterwards, but maybe it's not happening enough. It's not happening, you know, once a week or whatever, uh, three times a week in the last month. Uh, maybe it's just happening once a week or maybe it's happening just a couple times a month. And so those are definitely clients that I um, talk to on, you know, on a regular basis as well. And then the emotional eating really is clients who will say, you know, I associate food with just sadness or with happiness and sadness. Like every time there's something to celebrate, I turn towards food. Every time I'm sad about something, I go to food to cope. Um, Every time I'm stressed or angry, I turn to food and I overeat. A lot of the time, clients will talk about overeating at nighttime too. So maybe during the day, they're really busy. They're, you know, in their routine, taking care of kids, going to work or maybe at school. And then at nighttime is kind of when they'll say, you know, just all falls apart. That's just when I feel really out of control. And I might reach, I might have dinner and then I'll reach for a snack and then another snack and then it just keeps going. Or like I said, they might order DoorDash or go to the drive-thru, whatever it may be. But the overeating tends to happen at night for a lot of people who struggle with binge eating, emotional eating, or even just compulsive overeating. I'm using those terms not interchangeably. So those are like three different things. And the reason I'm using those terms is because they're related. You know, it has to do with binge eating. But again, because it doesn't show up as often or because it might be more related to the way that somebody copes with feeling sad or stressed, but then when things are better, they don't really binge at all. And they can um, identify like real good periods of time where it doesn't happen. And then sometimes when it does happen, that kind of thing, they are just three different things. Now, the clients who do come to me for bariatric surgery evaluations, because we do uh, those types of evaluations in the Red Clinic, clients who are looking at bariatric surgery are looking at it as a weight loss option. So clients tend to have the diet mentality. We've talked all about diet culture on the Red Clinic podcast in the past, um, and we probably will here in the future because there's just so much to say about it. But the thing about diet culture 
is that it's an entire industry, right? So dieting has become an industry. And in, if people were successful at the diet, then the industry would go out of business. So it is actually the business of the industry to make sure that nobody's ever really successful at a diet. Um, and so that's really how it works. A new fad diet comes out every few weeks or months and several people will jump on to the dieting bandwagon. They'll try it out. They'll talk about how it worked. It, it gave them some good results. And then something happened and they fell off the wagon, pretty much gained all the weight back and went back to old habits. So somebody actually said this to me today when we were talking about something else. It's essentially like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. So we might we might have like a quick fix for it, but we're not addressing the real problem. And over time, it's just going to get worse if we don't address the real problem. So with bariatric surgery clients, I see that a lot. Um, they come in wanting the weight loss surgery because they've tried every diet that you can imagine and they're not having the long-term success that they truly want to have in their life. So a lot of times the clients will come in for the evaluation because insurance or their surgeon is requiring it before they have the procedure in order to determine if psychologically the client is prepared for post-operative success. That's really what they're looking for. So they essentially want the psychologist who's doing the assessment to say, yep, the client's fine. They have good awareness of what's entailed for being successful after the procedure. They know that, you know, they're going to have to change their lifestyle. Um, this person's approved for surgery. That's what essentially they're looking for. <clears throat> what happens most of the time, though, is I'm not able to make that recommendation because after I've done an assessment with somebody who's interested in the bariatric procedure, I generally find that they have been dealing with binge eating disorder or emotional eating, emotional overeating, compulsive overeating um, for a very long time. It's been a way that they've been dealing with stress or emotions it's something that they have felt out of control about or, you know, um, struggle, struggle with feelings of guilt or shame surrounding their eating patterns. And that true emotional and psychological work has never truly been done. And so without addressing the real problem, we're essentially setting the person up to fail yet another weight loss attempt. Except with bariatric surgery, it's so invasive it's so, uh, it's so risky. And the person is set up for a lot of things that they never have had to do before. So after surgery, somebody actually has to be like on an all liquid diet for several weeks. They're not allowed to do any heavy lifting. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and many clients end up actually just being extremely malnourished afterwards. And so one of the things, and so with malnourishment comes weakness and poor mood and more injury, um, overall sense of unhappiness. And these are some of the things that people don't really talk about after bariatric surgery because they're, they're getting so much um, feedback about like, oh, you've lost weight, you look great, right? So how can that person who's being praised for looking great actually say, yeah, but I feel really crappy, Right because now I'm really malnourished and I had no idea what was entailed. And I have all these urges to go eat my favorite foods and I can't, and I don't know what to do with myself anymore. So that psychological um, uh, well-being is not really ever truly addressed. And after the procedure, they're put in a situation that makes it even more hard to cope. So that's usually what I find when I'm doing these assessments. And um, I talk with the clients about that a lot. You know, I mean, this is just another weight loss um, trick that you're trying. And it's actually going to be much more difficult to recover from, from if we're not psychologically ready for something like this. One of the things that surgeons will do is they'll ask their um, patients to go see a dietitian for maybe one or six or 10 visits or something like that 
before they actually have the procedure. So along with getting a psychological assessment, they also have to go and get um, a few visits completed with a dietitian. And a lot of the times, the doctor will order a 5 to 10 pound weight loss before the surgery can occur. And they'll say that because they're trying to get the client in the pattern of dieting, right? So if we can kind of kickstart that behavior before the surgery, then they'll be more likely to maintain that behavior after the surgery, or at least that's the mentality. So most patients are required to lose five to 10 pounds before they can even get the surgery just to prove that they do know how to eat less and move more. Well, the thing is, is that those are all things that most of these patients or clients have tried before, and they've also reverted or gone right back to the previous weight gain. Um, And so it's going to be exactly the same, except this time with the surgery, it's just much, much more dangerous. So typically, the kind of work that we do with clients who have binge eating disorder or emotional eating, emotional overeating, or compulsive overeating is going to look really similar. Um, Even the bariatric uh, client, right? They're going to come to me. I'm going to say, you know what? I'm not recommending you get this surgery at least for the next six months because I want to give you a fair shot at actually addressing the emotional issues at the core before you decide to go through with this. Um, And so most people will take that recommendation. They'll say, yeah, I can do it. You know, I I think what you're saying actually makes a lot of sense. No one's ever talked to me about this before. In a way, it's kind of a huge relief. It can be frustrating at first because I'm kind of saying, "Mm, no, (laughs) I'm not going to approve this. Um, But they understand it's because I have their best interest at heart. And so um, we'll start the work. And the work for binge eating disorder is individual therapy. It can look like family therapy too, or, or couples therapy or whatever, you know, however old the person is. Um, and then nutrition sessions. And we like to take a health at every size approach um, a lot with our clients who have emotional overeating or who may be struggling with being overweight. And the reason we do that is because we're trying to really show someone that dieting mentality can mentally trap you. Um, And it's miserable. It's not happy. It's let's try this diet or let's try that diet, lose weight, be happy. The number on the scale goes down. So now my self-esteem goes up, but it's not sustainable. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. So health at every size is really the model of, hey, let's look at health in a much more holistic approach. And there's literature out there on this approach. This approach is very uh, well used in eating disorder treatment these days. It's it's a very um, uh, popular treatment for binge eating disorder, for emotional overeating, and all the things that we're talking about today. Um, So essentially, we define health in a, we just like widen the scope, we expand the horizon of the word health. It's not just medical or physical health, it's our psychological well-being, it's our spiritual health, our emotional well-being, um, it's our overall lifestyle, and increasing or improving our quality of life. And so if you do certain things to really focus on yourself holistically, essentially you or ultimately you start feeling better. And honestly, it's kind of a natural side effect when you start making just better choices in your life um, where your body will trend down if you are meant to lose weight to your natural set point. And so the goal is not weight loss. The goal is getting you to where you're naturally meant to be. And sometimes it can mean weight loss. So we're absolutely not going to put a client on a diet. We throw all diets out the window. I can't tell you how many times clients have come to us and said, well, I knew I was coming here today. So yesterday I started Weight Watchers Um, and it's okay because I get like my first month free. And then I'll say, well, you are more than welcome here at the Red Clinic, but your diet isn't. And we have to have a really like real conversation about that because we cannot get started with a client who wants to count calories or points and track everything and be really neurotic about it 
Because once again, we're in that mindset and we know that mindset only leads one way. We're trying to open someone's mind. We're trying to help them see that there's much more to it. And the diet culture, diet industry has really uh, brainwashed a lot of us. And so we're trying to help people understand that it's, it's more than just, you know, diet and exercise. You have to be happy as a whole person. We also really work very hard with our clients to change their relationship with exercise. So the term that we like to use with the health at every size approach is joyful movement. We really want to find joy in how we move our bodies. Because a lot of times people will associate exercise with punishment or, you know, I ate, I ate the, the cake earlier today, so I have to go burn it off and, you know, I can't have dinner and I need to just work out because I have, you know, shame on me for eating some cake, right? Um, and so exercise has become this thing that is associated with burning calories and doing it to change the way we look versus what we're supposed to do with our bodies, they were actually designed to move. You know, if, if we didn't have working legs, for example, we can't get up and walk to the car and take ourselves to work every day. Our bodies are something that we try to learn in treatment, how to appreciate and be grateful for, and really um, just take into consideration like all that it was designed to do. I mean, come on, like childbirth is a crazy thing. And like our bodies just figure that out, right, ladies? So appreciating the body for what it really is and, and what we can use it for is part of that. But then joyful movement is about increasing quality of life. So do you really enjoy running on a treadmill or do you like to dance? Do you really enjoy uh, doing 50 jumping jacks every morning or would you prefer to go for a walk or take a swim? You know, how do you find joy? Do you have a sport that you like to play? Um, because it helps you stay connected with people in your life and it gives you a really good outlet um, as a way to spend your time. All of that is actually exercise, but we try to stay away from that term because it's so um, associated with burning calories and weight loss. So that's just kind of an introduction into some of the treatment that we'll do with clients, but we also really go to the core of, you know, working on the guilt and the shame and finding healthy ways to replace those urges to binge um, and move away from that. Because a lot of times when people have urges to binge, it's because it's emotionally related. So we'll say, well, actually, let's look at the emotions. Let's figure out how you can get in control so that this eating disorder doesn't actually control you anymore. Um, okay, so that's binge eating disorder. That's the DSM synopsis. That's the real life practical application. And that's actually the treatment of what we do at the Red Clinic. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Next week, um, stay tuned. I think we're going to talk about avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Thank you.